Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Danny Moore, and I'm here to talk to you today about some of the latest updates in the CXL specification. Um, the 3.0 specification was just released in August, and I get to speak uh, in detail to you about some of the new features and capabilities that we've added in the consortium since our previous spec release, the 2.0 specification release was released in 2020. Um, I've personally been working in the interconnect space for some 20 years, primarily focused on PCIe switching and fabrics. And I've also been fortunate enough to have been involved in the CXL consortium since its beginnings in uh, 2019. Currently, I'm a contributing member in the marketing working group, where I've been most recently focused on the uh, 3.0 release. <clears throat> I'm currently driving uh, CXL product management for Rambus. And with the release of CXL 3.0 specification, I get to speak to you about some of the new device types, some of the new capabilities, and the interconnects that have been introduced in the latest uh, release. So for a quick agenda, um, I'll give you a quick overview introduction of 3.0 and some of, the, some of the highlights of the new specification. And then I'll jump straight into some of the novel device types, the multi-headed devices, um, some of the new capabilities, such as the dy dynamic capacity device framework, which is uh, really interesting. And then finally, we'll touch on some of the new expanded fabric capabilities that really brings uh, CXL and CXL fabrics beyond the rack. So let's start off with the, uh, the overview. So, the 3.0 spec has a ton of great new stuff. Um, there's a lot of overlap on these key features that you see on the left here, uh, with 3.0 really kind of bringing composability and compute disaggregation to the next level. Um, <clears throat> the fabric capabilities and management have, has been expanded. Uh, we define a new uh, port-based routing elements to the 3.0 fabric switch. So we're no longer constrained by the same host domains that we were previously constrained by. Um, we improve memory sharing and pooling. You know, with pooling, um, you know, the functionality that we that was brought in 2.0 has been expanded in 3.0 with new device types and capa capabilities, which I'll be talking about later. And then we define memory sharing, right? So now resources in um, separate domains can now share the same underlying memory capacity which previously was a restriction. And all of this is supported by a a hardware defined coherency mechanism. You know, the spec has defined uh, a new new coherency mechanism to really manage that that coherency. Um, you know, so now the memory can be accessed simultaneously by more than one host and still guarantee that every host sees the most up to date data at that location without the need of a software managed coordination effort. And that really touches on the symmetric coherency concept that, that's highlighted on the left here. Um, you know, 3.0 moves away from the previously CXL defined bias based coherency. So now devices themselves are able to invalidate a host cache. And this is really a key feature that enables a litany of 3.0 features, including the memory sharing, which we just talked on, touched on, the peer to peer memory access, and um, some you know, advanced kind of compute capabilities like near memory processing. And all of this all you know, still maintaining the same backward compatibility that we're used to seeing in um, CXL previous specification releases and that we also see in um, PCIe. So here's a, a chronological representation of the CXL features pinned to their perspective um, specification releases. Um, moving from 2.0 to 3.0, we see a doubling of the transfer rates. Um, as now in 3.0, we're going to be sitting on uh, PCIe Gen 6 electricals, as opposed to in 2.0 or 1.1, where we're sitting on 5.0 electricals. And this gives us a raw bandwidth for a by 16 link of 256 gigabytes per second. Now, obviously, flip packing and link overhead extracts from that total bandwidth. So your actual, um, your actual throughput will be really based on the workload that you're running. But by, by sitting on top of the PCIe electricals, we get all the benefits of PCIe's FEC and their CRC, which is gonna give us you know, strong, reliable, error-free link operation that we're used to seeing on our PCIe links. 
And then the additional space in the new expanded 256 by foot and, and that higher throughput are really some of the building blocks that enable much of the 3.0 feature set, including the fabrics, the sharing, the, the symmetry, and the peer-to-peer -peer items that I uh, mentioned previously. So let's jump into some of these new uh, novel device types, the multi-headed device devices. <clears throat> so here's a quick review of, of memory pooling in 2.0 and 3.0 with the new um, multi-headed device or MHD concept. So, so pooling is not new to 3.0. Um, with 2.0, we really brought the pooling concept with switches and multi, multiple logical devices or MLDs. But the MHD brings in some new optimizations. So in 2.0, single logical devices or multiple logical device pooling was really enabled with the use of CXL switches, where resources can be assigned dynamically to different host domains. Um, but in 3.0, we introduced the multi-headed device, which eliminates the need of a physical switch to implement the pooled memory solution itself. And obviously, there's going to be some performance benefits as as flits are no longer required to traverse the CXL link, and in combination with some of the other capabilities that I'll discuss later, we get to see some improvements in the device composability as well. So there's, there's two types of um, multi-headed device. One is a multi-headed single logical device, or MHSLD. The other is a multi-headed multiple logical device, an MHMLD. And the, the the differentiation between the two device types is really how, how their underlying resources are presented to the um, device heads or the hosts. So with an MH SLD, an SLD is presented to each head, right? And we have a one-to-one -one mapping of the logical devices to the heads themselves. And with an MH MLD, um, an MLD is presented to each head with up to 16 logical devices being mapped to a single head. Now, this really requires a switch for the full kind of MLD uh, functionality. So here we provide a logical abstraction of the MHDs, the MHSLD on the left and the MH, MHD on the right, MLD on the right. Um, you know, from a physical media perspective, we see the same pool of memory and that both device types maintain similar L, uh, logical device pool abstraction layers. Um, and this was really an implementation specific uh, uh, method that the consortium adopted so that we could maintain the existing logical device management framework that was previously defined for um, MLDs and 2.0. Um, you know, so we can see, we can see here that uh, we maintain that same, that same logical abstraction framework but the, 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 the difference between the two device types is really how they're presented to the head. With the, with the um, MHMLD on the right, you can see multiple logical devices presented to each head, whereas with the MHSLD on the left, we see just single logical devices. So now let's move on to the uh, new dynamic capacity device capability. Um, there's really some great use cases uh, uh, supported by this capability. So first of all, like what, what is the problem statement that we're actually trying to solve with the DCD capability? So prior to the DCD capability, the allocation and deallocation of memory was actually a very disruptive operation from the host perspective. Um, the capacity can be added or released by reprogramming the HDM decoders and and the framework exists for, for that to take place. And on the diagram on the right, we can see a, a memory device without the DCD capability. We see that the, the HDM decoders themselves are dedicated to each head on the device, and the decoders are programmed with their respective ranges, right? So the hosts don't need to do anything different than they would with a directly attached traditional uh, uh, type three device. The difficulty arises when some of the physical media range or DPA range from one of the hosts needs to move to the other host. And the non-DCD framework can support this. The HDM decoders can be reprogrammed, but for the host to be able to map the new con contiguous range back into its overall memory map, generally the traffic needs to be stopped and a system reset is, is likely required. 
And really, this is the limitation that the DCD capability addresses. <clears throat> so on the right here, we show a, a, a diagram of a device with the DCD capability. Here we see the, the HDM decoders are programmed to the maximum capacity that the device could potentially expose, right? In the non-DCD framework, the HDM decoders only expose partial ranges of the underlying, underlying media. But in this framework, the, the HDM decoders expose the entire range of the underlying media. So in this manner, both of the hosts map sufficient ranges in their media space to address the entire range of, of the uh, underlying media. But with this, we create a bit of a new problem. And that is that you know, now that the entire range of the underlying media is mapped to both hosts, how do we ensure that hosts aren't overwriting each other or accessing each other's data? So we needed the, some additional framework that still, uh, still, still allows us to restrict which hosts can physically access which DPA ranges at any moment while still exposing the entire range in the, uh, in the HDM decoders themselves. And that's really solved by some of the new functionality and changes to the Fabric Manager. Um, the, the Fabric Manager is expanded in 3.0 to include this uh, DCD management command set. And that command set is used to query and configure the DCD itself. The device's physical media is subdivided into regions. Um, each region can be configured by the FM for, capa for capacity and granularity. And that region can be further subdivided and allocated and deallocated. So the allocation and deallocation of these blocks is actually maintained in an extent list, which is also programmed by the FM and organized by the system orchestrator. And that extent list is uh, shown on the right here. Um, and it's really that extent list that is communicated to the host to describe what physical memory ranges it is authorized to access. Even though the host has mapped the entire memory range, um, the extent list restricts the, the um, ranges within that range that the host is allowed to access. Now, potentially any host could potentially go rogue and try to access a range that is outside of its extent list. And in, in that case, the, the device holding the extent list actually treats um, any unauthorized access as simply an HDM decoder miss. And in this manner, the physical media is still protected against uh, any rogue agents or unauthorized access. So now let's quickly jump into um, some of the updates uh, in Fabrics. <clears throat> so in 3.0, we're no longer restricted to the familiar tree-based hierarchies um, that we find so pervasive in the data center today, right? Um, the, the restrictive PCIe style um, uh, tree hierarchies. Um, you know, in those scenarios, the hosts are really, or the, the, the resources are really confined to specified host domains, right? So in 2.0, switches were able to provide the device fan out. Um, we could expand the size of any host physical address range, but communications were really restricted to only within that domain. With 3.0, we now really enable cross-domain communications. Um, we bring the, bring the definition of a CXL fabric switch itself. And then also on top of that, a port-based routing framework um, that really brings new capabilities into the, into the fabric itself. And so with the addition of these new fabric capabilities, we can now define new fabric attached memory devices as well, such as FAMS, as an example. Um, shown here are just a sampling of a wide array of how fabric switches using the port-based routing mechanism and, and standard fan-out switches using host-based routing can, can be um, configured and reconfigured in a, in a wide array of uh, variations. Um, on the right, 
we can also see that with the use of port-based routing or PBR, um, we can now enable mesh type, type typologies um, on the, as you can see on the right, where there's multiple paths to the same destination. Um, now, such loops can create the potential of deadlock due to you know, some circular dependencies, um, but really this can be avoided with some careful attention paid to the routing tables, which reside in the um, PBR switches themselves or the fabric switches. And all of that is, is um, managed by the fabric manager. Now, this is generally outside the scope of the specification, but the, man the management framework is um, in place. So it's, it's really a system implementation detail, but the framework exists for um, a wide array of configurations. Um, you know, this is by no means a complete list of topologies. Um, the consortium made a, a really concerted effort to try not to restrict any type of uh, fabric topology. Um, so the, the new fabric features really provide a robust path to expand composable systems beyond the rack while still capitalizing on the familiar load store semantics that our processors are used to. Um, you know, all the traffic within the fabric is routed by the port-based routing ID, not an address. And this, this is really what allows us to um, uh, connect from switch to switch and carry traffic from multiple um, virtual hierarchies without worrying about address collisions. Um, we use a 12-bit source port and destination port ID, um, SPIDs and DPIDs, um, and that really enables expansion up to over 4,000 hosts or devices. So you can see that you know, we're really pushing the, the overall framework in terms of size of a, of a switch fabric well, to well over 4,000 devices. And then with the addition of uh, GFAM devices or globally global fabric attached memory devices, we're really enab enabling these potentially huge, enormous pools of memory. You know, an example here is, you know, 2,000 hosts accessing a pool of over 2,000 um, GFAM devices. So uh, thanks a lot for listening to my talk today. Um, for more information, you can go to computeexpresslink.org. You can grab yourself a copy of the latest 3.0 specification. Um, while you're there, there's plenty of other resources uh, available, training material, white papers, um, blogs, um, and webinars. And also we have some content available at rambus.com. Um, I hope you enjoyed my presentation and thank you so much for your time.